Hi, I'm James Verdeer and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. Today's episode is a mostly on-site podcast from Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I was graciously hosted earlier this spring by the Association of Southeastern Biologists at their annual meeting. I was impressed by the meeting's breadth and by the exciting research that was being presented there, as well as how welcoming an environment it was for student participants in particular. And I just had a fantastic time talking to scientists representing numerous fields, institutions, and career stages. I also caught up with a few guests after the fact, and you will hear those interviews sort of interspersed with the on-site conversations. But I urge everyone listening to learn more about ASB, and you can check the show notes for a link. And of course, you should consider joining and attending a meeting yourselves. I had a great time, and I'm sure you will too. Um, one of the recurring themes of my time at the meeting was the emphasis that ASB puts on creating a positive environment for early career scientists. And so first up is Barbara Comer, who's an undergraduate biology major at Georgia Southern University. Let's go to the interview. Welcome. Hello. So you were just giving a poster presentation? Uh, yes, sir. What was that about? Oh, uh, we are looking at the um, estrian effects on seed production on Spartina alterniflora, which is the smooth cord grass in the saltwater marshes along the east coast of our country and the Gulf Coast. Okay, cool. So these are what, are, you know, I assume wetlands grasses? Yes. And what did you find out? So over three weeks, uh, we went out to Rodney Hall Boat Ramp, mm -hmm. um, which is a local marsh um, near our university. Uh, there's a lot of uh, foot traffic, like boats, people. And uh, we collected about 15 spikelets uh, on each visit. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, separated, or we counted the seeds, and then we separated them into um, three different treatments, uh, deionized water, estrian water, filtered estrian water, and autoclaved estrian water. And then we left them um, in storage for overwintering. Over uh -huh. And um, after about two months, so in January, we brought them out of dormancy and put them in the same treatments um, in our growth chamber. Just look at um, germination rates. Okay, cool. And what are the differences between the, di you know, between the different treatments? What were you, what were you expecting and what kind of turned out? Yeah. So we were expecting that the seeds would, um, produce, uh, embryos better or filled seeds in the estrian and au uh, the autoclaved and filtered estrian water. And we were expecting the same results for seed germination, mm -hmm. but it was very interesting because the DI water um, had lower um, filled seeds, which we were expecting. However, with um, the seed termination, um, it did better in the DI water than the estrian water. Okay, was that a surprise? It was. And do you have any idea what would account for that or still waiting to find out? Oh, um, so looking at the results, like we we're, we still have trials going on, so this is all preliminary. Sure. So we uh, have come. We've concluded that probably the um, high salinity may cause the issue of uh, growth. Okay, great. And just broadly speaking, is this particular grass, um, you know, a positive feature of the ecosystem, or it's a it plays a very vital role in the ecosystem. So um, a lot of migratory birds, fish, um, periwinkle snails also use that plant. Um, it also uh, helps um, keep the soil stabilized. Uh huh. That's cool. How, how did you get so involved in doing this type of research and you know meeting attendance as an undergraduate? It seems really cool. Yeah, so um, I actually started off as an intern at um, our campus's uh, sustainable um, aquaponics research center uh -huh. and the curator uh, uses the same lab as Dr. Josephine who is my mentor and she was counting Spartina seeds when I first met her and then we started talking and she roped me into her lab so I've been doing research with her since spring of uh, 2022. Oh that's really great and so how are you enjoying the meeting so far? I love it. I love looking at all the different posters and getting to ask fellow students about their research. Any particular presentations you're planning on attending or? Um, I'm honestly probably going to go back to the hotel room and finish my homework. <laughs> totally understandable. <laughs> all right. Well, I won't keep you any longer. Um, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. 
And next up, I had the opportunity to chat with the aforementioned Dr. Heather Josting, who's an associate professor of biology at Georgia Southern University and also the vice president of ASB. So we had a chance to talk about some meeting and association related items as well. Let's go to that interview. Thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, you're very welcome. Okay, so um, I was hoping you could just introduce yourself briefly, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing here at this ASB meeting. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, I am Dr. Heather Josting. I'm an associate professor uh, at Georgia Southern University in Savannah. Um, I'm a coastal plant ecologist, so mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time in the field in the marsh. Um, and I'm also vice president of ASB. I've been coming for about 10 years bringing students. So in addition to helping plan the meeting, I also brought five undergraduate research students to present this year. Oh, that's great. And we've just spoken with one of them. Yes, you did. You spoke with Barbara. Yeah, and she, uh, she told us about some great research um, using Spartina. Yes, so we um, are interested in trying to develop seed propagation protocols so that we can have Spartina grown from seed and nursery production so that it can be used in living shorelines and coastal salt marsh restoration. Oh, that's great. We didn't get into that aspect of it, but is the, is the idea that if you can, you know, uh, grow it in the lab, propagate it in the lab, um, you know, put together methods for that, then you can eventually you know, restore shorelines and stuff. So they already do use Spartina, but oftentimes the Spartina is, um, is clonally reproduced, which means uh -huh. you know that it's asexual, so it's really low genetic variation in that nursery stock. Uh -huh. um, and a lot of the uh, plants that are used, at least in Georgia, are coming from out of state. Okay. Um, so there's research that shows that uh, using local um, plants because they are locally adapted to the conditions uh, increases restoration success and so that's our kind of reason for wanting to collect Georgia seed um, and then there's also studies that show that there is high genetic variation within Spartina populations suggesting that sexual reproduction and seedling recruitment is actually important um, so we have that's why we want to use seeds so that we can have a local stock for restoration that has high genetic variations to restore um, and maximize restoration success and also restore ecosystem function. Oh, that's really, really cool. And so, you know, how long have you been uh, involved in that particular aspect of research? I am, so I've been collecting seeds now for the, since 2019. So uh -huh. we started this in fall in 2019 and we've been uh, collecting seeds every fall since. Uh -huh. um, and then we'll do some kind of seed storage because uh, they have to be stored in cold, wet conditions to break dormancy. So we'll do various experiments looking at what kind of containers are the best and what kind of water should you do salinity. And then we do germination trials in the fall. And so we'll do germination experiments um, and then in the summer, we take our seedlings and we do uh, like uh, nursery production, um, alternative nursery production methods uh, in the greenhouse. So we kind of do a whole year of of looking into this question. Oh, that's really cool. And I'm, I'm curious about the, the, the field aspect of that. Um, you know, what's it like? It, what, it, it's marshy, I'm guessing. Got a lot it of is mud. marshy. Um, it is beautiful. Uh -huh. um, it, is, uh, it is my zen place. Um, but it is buggy. Uh, it yes. is hot, uh, and you will get stuck in the mud at least once. And so it is muddy. Um, it's kind of my thing when I tell undergrad students when they want to join my lab. I say, if you don't like to get hot, muddy, dirty, stinky, and bit by bugs, don't join my lab. Um, but it is really nice. We, we tend to try to uh, go to sites that are accessible by foot and by car. Right. Um, and we also go during low tide just to try to get as far as we can. Um, but there has been quite a few moments where people have been stuck in mud. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna ask a question about that because as a kayaker in the you know uh, Chesapeake Bay area, I often find myself stuck in mud every time I've gotta you know walk the kayak a little bit to get to the next piece of open water. Uh, what do you wear on your feet so that you don't lose shoes? Well, I think that depends on who you ask. Okay. Uh, I, <laughs> I wear boots. Um, which is probably not the greatest um, because the mud when you sink because I have just like mud boots Yeah, um, they go about up to your knees, but when you sink the mud starts filling into your boots Right, so it just gets you stuck more um, My collaborator and my grad student they are big proponents of old tennis shoes Right so that you tie them really tight and they don't get lost. Yeah, I think I lost one when it wasn't tied really tight But it happens. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the meeting. You mentioned that you bring undergraduate students here Yes, I've been bringing undergraduate graduate since uh, 2015. And what do you think the value of a meeting like this is for those undergraduate students? What do they get out of it? Um, well, 
I think for me, uh, I bring them here because I want them to have the entire process of science. Uh -huh. And so just giving them snapshots really doesn't introduce them to what it's like to be a scientist and to do science. Right. And so I feel like it's really important for them to see the entire process through. And the very end of that process is presenting and disseminating your results to your peers. Um, and so I think it's really important to bring them here. I also think it's a great networking opportunity for them because many of them are juniors and seniors. They may be looking for graduate programs um, or they may be looking for their next step. Um, and not only is there good networking opportunities, but there are workshops that are geared towards graduating students. We had one yesterday that was, what do I do after I graduate? Sure. And so I feel like they just get a really good experience here um, and kind of get that that final, this is, this is what it's like to be a scientist. Yeah, that's really cool. And one thing I, you know, um, this struck me. I've only been here a little while um, today, but I, you know, just walking around the exhibit hall, there's an incredible diversity of research that goes on here. Yes, it is uh, biology from the minuscule to the macro, right? Yeah, yeah. it's it's really really cool. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, you're very welcome. And just to change things up a little bit, I had the next guest handle the introduction, so I'll leave you waiting with bated breath to find out who that is. Uh, but I did just want to frame the conversation by saying we had a great chat about research, but then we quickly moved back into some of the themes that we've been discussing already about student involvement and the importance of getting people to meetings and having them participate across all career stages. So I think you'll enjoy this one. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Uh, if you don't mind, would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Certainly. My name is Jeremy Wrench, and I'm an associate professor of biology at Francis Marion University, small school in South Carolina, about 3,000-ish students. I'm a plant biologist, evolutionary ecologist, perhaps, uh, with a love of carnivorous plants. Great. And let's talk a little bit about those carnivorous plants. What sort of research do you do with these carnivorous plants? Well. Um, I've in the past done some population genetics. I'm really interested in how pitcher plants in the Saracenia genus hybridize. Okay. They hybridize freely. They have the same karyotype between species. And so as long as they flower at the same time, they can make viable hybrids. Oh, cool. And those viable hybrids then allow for back crossing to one or both parents, mm -hmm. which allows for really interesting hybrids. You can have hybrids that are 50% two different species or 25% four different species just through naturally occurring hybrid swarms. Tell me a little bit about, you know, pitcher plants in general. They're carnivorous. You know, how do they, how do they capture their prey and, and what do they do with it? Yeah, that's right. So if we're talking about something like Saracenia, these are uh, passive traps. They don't have activity like that Venus flytrap you might think so of So they're not closing. snapping shot on anything. Exactly right. right. Not with Saracenia. What happens, although there are some neat tricks, so mm -hmm. one of the Saracenia species, Flava, a yellow pitcher plant, it laces some nectar um, okay. with a drug and drugs the insects, and the insects kind of fall in the pitcher or not. And if they fall in the pitcher, then that's a quick little meal. That's very crafty. Sneaky. Yeah. There are a lot of tricks. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, you know ASB and um, you know your work with the organization. So could you tell us a little bit about you know kind of what you've done and your involvement with the organization? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, currently, I am the chair of the Committee on Human Diversity for the Association of Southeastern Biologists. Um, we do a few things that I think are really important. Sure. We're, we're kind of all about bringing everybody to the table yeah, in absolutely. various ways. Yeah. One of the ways we do that is by hosting a post-baccalaureate or grad school preparedness workshop here right. at ASB. Uh, and so we bring in panelists and we talk about career paths and we talk about how to get ready for graduate school if that's what you decide to do. Right. So we talk about CV building and personal statements. And the real power of it is that for hours, students just ask us questions. We we devise uh, a PowerPoint, of course, and we have things to talk about, but the students have no end of questions that are smart questions. Yeah. No, that, I mean, that's that's really cool. It, it, I mean, it kind of feeds back in my mind to, you know, some of the stuff that we do at AIBS where, you know, we, we kind of look at the career trajectory for, you know, scientists from, um, you know, uh, high school through graduate school and, and into, you know, um, academia or not, or industry, wherever you wind up. And there's really not a lot of guideposts in those sort of, you know, liminal spaces between different stages. Like there's, there's not really anybody telling you, here's how you do this next thing. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And our hope for this is to 
both show alternative options, right? Not everything is medical school or dental school or even graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, there are other post-baccalaureate options to pursue. Um, but also, those are traditional paths, and so we like to talk about things that are important for everybody, probably yeah. CV building and personal statement writing. Yeah. Um, but then we go into some specific topics like how do you actually find an advisor? Do you apply to a program or apply to a specific advisor? And right, right. how do you talk about funding and health care? Because it's your job now, so you need to be able to pay rent and you sure. need health care. And so we, we kind of, I think if anything, it kind of eases the burden or eases the anxiety a little bit of the students to. Yeah, it's, it, it's in a sense, it's kind of hitting on, you know, the things that nobody knows at that stage, but everybody thinks that everybody else knows. Yeah, I think that's probably a beautiful way of summarizing it. Yeah, that, that's a lot of fun. And I also want to touch a little bit on what you said about, you know, um, the way that this meeting kind of uh, brings everybody to the table. I, I know that there have been some, you know, student travel awards, et cetera. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about how, uh, if not through, you know, the committee, how that kind of works? You know? Yeah, that's right. It's a, actually a huge privilege. I consider it to be able to give out quite a few, as a committee, quite a few travel awards for, for this conference. We have a number of first-generation college student travel awards. I think we gave out six of those this year. Uh, that covers registration, uh, which is a big chunk, of course, of traveling to a conference. So those students receive registration, comped, uh, as well as some of the ticketed events. And then we give out a, an award, the Lafayette Frederick Award, that is named in honor of one of the past presidents of ASB, a uh, mycologist, a professor, uh, certainly an advocate. He was important for the integration of uh, ASB as a society. And so that's, that's a really wonderful award where an underrepresented minority student gets an all expenses paid trip to the conference. That's room and board and travel and all of the ticketed events, registration. Um, and so this is a way that we kind of help bring everybody to the table. Now, everybody is a big word. Sure. Of course, it can't be everybody, but we try to facilitate as much travel as possible. No, that's really cool. And, you know, just looking around, it seems like it's an incredible opportunity for all of those who got to participate. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. And next up, we're going to take a little bit of a step away from the meeting itself and go to a portion of a Zoom conversation that I had with Chinieri Knight, who's an assistant professor at Tuskegee University in the Department of Biology. We talked a lot about fungi, but another thing that we chatted about was the Lafayette Frederick Award and its importance to ASB and his importance in the history of ASB. And so that was a great conversation, and I'm very grateful to be able to bring a portion of it to you now. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so I thought we might start off um, chatting a little bit about science. So um, what sorts of things did you study and, and what sorts of things have you researched? What are you working on? Well, currently I am a professor of microbial ecology and microbiology here at Tuskegee. So in this area, it's a, a small school in rural Alabama. And so with that and the, the environment, the ecosystem here, uh, we have a lot of access to forest and so um, and a school of agriculture and also veterinary medicine. So I have the opportunity to do interdisciplinary studies um, in environmental biology, looking at the biodiversity of uh, fungi in the area. Uh, and also investigating the secondary metabolites and looking at, uh, I have this collection or I inherited this collection from my mentor, my major mentor, Dr. Lafayette Frederick. Uh, so now trying to characterize those specimens and also find uh, applications for them, um, primarily looking at like antibiotic discovery. Okay, that's interesting. So it's it's antibiotics that are the secondary metabolites uh, potentially of the the fungi that are in your area. Well, just think about like the history too. So we know the like one of the most famous antibiotics. What do you think about when you think of, like one of the most famous antibiotics in history? Penicillin. Exactly. Hey, got one. Penicillin is produced by the fungus penicillium. So. Um, you know, a, a lot of what we understand already about antibiotics or a lot of the antibiotics that we have are derived from fungi. Um, and so looking, we've always looked at uh, 
fungi and bacteria because those are the decomposers. So in the ecosystem, they uh, live in the soil primarily, you know, primarily in the soil and they are competing, competing for resources, competing for space. And so the antibiotics are actually uh, natural defense systems that are excreted by them for um, competition in the environment. So we're just able to uh, exploit that natural um, relationship that occurs uh, in the soil in which these products are produced. Okay, so this will be the gross oversimplification that only an English major could stumble into. But is it something like the penicillium is creating the penicillin so that it doesn't get you know chewed up by a bunch of bacteria? Exactly. It's like, yeah, it's like their defense system or uh, armory artillery against other competing organisms in the environment, in the soil. Oh, that's cool. And and if these are certainly things of which we could use a heck of a lot more because of antimicrobial resistance and stuff like that. Exactly. And a lot of, so there, there are many more um, microbiologists or ecologists who study uh, bacteria uh, over fungi. There aren't that many like mycologists. Uh, and so um, the kingdom fungi is understudied overall. So whereas we have like people have um, deduced uh, things like E. coli, um, full genome sequence, and a lot of what we know, and even when we talk about uh, disease pathogens, bacillus, a lot of the bacteria, uh, it's still a lot to be explored in bacteria too, like don't get me wrong, but um, the fungi are, they are eukaryotic. And so because they're eukaryotic, um, you can use it as another model system to look at how it will be in animal systems and other eukaryotic organisms or creatures. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about um, ASB and, you know, how you got involved with that organization and, you know, kind of what sorts of things you've done with them. So I might seem like I'm like aging myself by saying this, but it's, it's been over like 20 years ago now. Um, my, my mentor who passed away, Dr. Lafayette Frederick, he was the first African-American president of, of ASB, and that was in the 60s. And so he made it a point that every year he would take students to the annual meeting and we would like do it old school. Like we would all drive down, we would pile up in the car and we would drive down and he would always make like, it was always a tour uh, along the way to go to the conference too. So, you know, different restaurants or other HBCUs uh, along the path in the South, colleagues, um, we would visit them. And so he would make it like a college tour slash American history slash ASB meeting, you know, that would be oh, like- Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. But with that, you know, he would tell us like um, the evolution of ASB and the time in which he, which he remembered when things were segregated, like they couldn't present, you couldn't stay in a hotel, like you would have to find separate housing and you would have to, uh, and so just, just thinking of that, of being in a position where, okay, this is my professor, and he's describing these times like uh, before integration um, and how you still had to navigate and uh, present your science and share your science. And like you said, you have the science part and you have the social science part, you know? Right, right. So you have to really learn how to get a degree in both, you know, like learn how to be able to navigate socially uh, and understand the history uh, and the intentions and the missions of these um, societies, but also understand that you're there uh, to do the science and to um, expand and advance the, the field too. He sounds like an, an incredible person and I, I deeply regret that I didn't get a chance to interview him as well, but I, I appreciate your telling his story um, to me here. Uh, 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 why don't we talk a little bit about uh, about the um, the scholarship um, that's, that's in his name? Okay, so that was in, and I remember we were at his, the, the dining room table 
putting it together. Uh, and this was, I was still in graduate school at the time. He always felt like, yeah, he wanted to have these awards. He wanted young people like to continue the the legacy or to continue that. So, right, right. yeah, we developed the travel award and it helped me understand really the, um, the unwritten role that you have as a scientist or in the career, you know, that you really will have to pioneer these initiatives um, and uh, be a part of science policy uh, to try to make sure that um, the students are able to still, you know, get that exposure, get the traveling and just have those arenas and venues in which they can, um, you know, share and communicate. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And I'm very grateful to you for helping keep those stories alive and helping, you know, shine light on them. Thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, being that historian part for, for science, too. And next up, we had another interviewee who was not able to make the meeting this year. And in this case, it's Jen Rohde Ward, who's a professor of biology at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. And as she'll explain to you in our conversation, a visiting professor at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. I'll let her tell you all about it. Thank you very much for joining me today. Great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So just to get us started, uh, why don't we talk about why you weren't at the ASB meeting this week? This uh, podcast is, of course, a, you know, a hybrid collaboration of some Zoom interviews and some in-person interviews. Um, but what have you been up to lately? I'm really excited to be on a Fulbright Fellowship to the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. The University of Cape Coast, Ghana is about 60,000 undergraduate students. It is the largest and highest ranked university in West Africa, and it's ranked number seven on the continent. I'm working here in the School of Biological Sciences. I've been teaching in the um, Department of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, as well as working with the university on some grant writing and curricular reform and some pedagogical reform, so changing ways in which courses are taught. That's really interesting. Why don't we talk a little bit about the pedagogical reform and, you know, also, in, you know, maybe what the curriculum is like, um, you know, over over in Ghana. Um, how has it differed from your experiences back at UNC Asheville? So the way that things are taught in Ghana in general is based on a British system. Um, Ghana was a British colony until 1957 when it was the first uh, country on the continent to gain independence from colonial powers. So the way that things are taught is very, um, very rote with heavy focus on memorization and on learning protocols. And so one thing that I've been working with my fellow faculty here on are ways to do more inquiry driven pedagogies, which is a, a trend that is really taking off in life sciences departments in the United States. I've been working now for um, four years as a fellow with Pulse, Partnership for Undergraduate Life Sciences Education, working on department level curricular reform. So that's one of the, the goals of my Fulbright is to demonstrate more inquiry driven ways of teaching and to help develop some curricular modules that will live on after I'm back in Asheville. Okay. And so I'm curious about you know, what those, um, you know, inquiry driven approaches are like in practice? Is it an undergraduate research experience type of situation? Or, you know, kind of how does that work on a, on a practical level? Yes, yeah, so we're working on some cures. So course based undergraduate research experiences for the 300 and 400 level laboratories. So rather than just learning how to extract DNA and do PCR, they're doing a semester long project focused on mostly here on, on crop plants. So things like cow peas, which are black eyed peas or ground nuts, which are peanuts. Um, there's a lot of research in this department on those, on those really important staple crops. So the students are focused on, on following from the beginning of the protocol to those getting DNA sequences, following something that has relevance to their daily life, to the community here. And also, it's still teaching them um, the protocols that they would learn during a typical, more rote laboratory exercise, but it's got some applications and it's got some opportunity for 
creativity as far as which genes the students focus on and how they present their data at the end. Okay, and I'm wondering now, you know, how have the students taken to it? Obviously, if they've had this sort of, you know, road instructional style throughout their secondary education, um, what's the experience been like for them to then kind of get into something that's a little bit different? Yes, uh, I, let, I, I met a lot of initial skepticism sure. and resistance and lack of confidence, which I will say I also have met with U.S. cohorts of students, right, if students aren't accustomed to sort of open-ended, not sure how their activities translate to their grades. That can be a little nerve wracking or not having a very clear expectation can be hard for people who are in that age group, right? This sort of 18 to 22 um, typical age university student, their, their prefrontal cortex is developing. And so it's sometimes not having clear boundaries on things is just challenging in and of itself. Um, so the students were a little skeptical, and they um, they 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 say uh, madam, right? But they'll they'll say um, ma, right? And sure, sure. like ma, we can't we can't do this, ma, 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 we can't do it. And I'm like, no, no, you can you can do it. So I sort of, and they you know they see me as I, I'm definitely a novelty. There are very few um, uh, foreigners at this university, actually. Uh, most people are Ghanaian or maybe from Cote d'Ivoire or maybe Togo or maybe uh, Nigeria, so so West Africa. Um, so I'm, I'm novel enough. I think that they were maybe a little will more willing to try an experiment like they, they expected me to not be fitting in as well as I could in the Ghanaian, typical Ghanaian tertiary, or, yeah, tertiary education system. So um, there, there was some skepticism, but we just have wrapped up classes this past week and finals start next week. And um, at the end of my last class for the, I, I've taught parts of three classes and then one class all the way through. I started in December on Zoom with them and then showed up in person in January. And a bunch of them came up at the end and um, said, you're such a great teacher. And they asked for my WhatsApp. So. I think I, I think I at least won this cohort, this particular group of students, there are 75 of them. So I, I think I won them over and I successfully executed an inquiry based botany lab. I, I teach a lot of botany at University of North Carolina Asheville with two lab sections of 150 students each. There's a, a big lab room here and they put in 150 students at once and my, I have one teaching assistant and I got them to do this inquiry based like match the flower to the pollinator um, kind of activity and they really liked it I and I say that because they stayed over their time and um, I think that you know students are busy right and sometimes when when it's time to go they want to go but the students all hung around and 150 students all punched over their lab benches with their flowers. It was really heartwarming, so. Wow, that is a large group, and that sounds like a great project. Thank you very much for sharing it with us today. I appreciate your time, and I'll let you get back to it, and we'll look forward to hearing from you either at future ASB meetings or from things that you send us from across the sea. Uh, best wishes, appreciate it. Thank you, I've appreciated it. And last up among our Zoom interviews before we head back to the meeting itself is Howard Dufeld, Professor of Biology at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. We talked a little bit about science and a number of different topics there, but we also got a chance to delve into the ASB meeting itself. He's held a variety of positions with the organization over the years and had a lot of valuable information to share. So let's go straight to that interview. Thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for asking. Okay, great. So I was hoping we could start off by talking a little bit about some of your science and some of the things that you work on. So um, why don't you just uh, tee us off with whatever uh, you find most interesting right now? You know, when I was finishing up um, my PhD, I kind of had in my mind, I wanted to do two types of science. I wanted to do basic science, just find out interesting patterns in nature. But I also wanted to do applied science. I wanted to do something that I could see an immediate benefit to society. So um, after doing a couple of postdocs, I ended up as, uh, well, I did a postdoc out at the EPA lab, which was the applied aspect. And I began working on air pollution effects on plants. So when I came to Appalachian uh, back in 1987, um, the first thing that happened was there was an opportunity to 
to work with the National Park Service in Great Smoky Mountains National Park on an air pollution project. And, uh, and then another one with the TVA. So I immediately uh, had a lot of research going on in the Southern Appalachians on air pollution effects. And I've been doing that off and on since almost you know over 30 years now and um, consulted with the EPA on the National Ambient Air Quality Standards and you know, published papers. The other side is uh, I've been very interested in um, understory plants and uh, Southern Appalachian plants. And so I've been doing research on, on those through the years and then particularly some invasive species also. And uh, I like to sort of put my hand in a lot of different areas, not so much focus on one thing uh, intently. Let's talk about the meeting a little bit. Uh, you know, you're a former president of uh, ASB. Um, so, you know, what's what's the history of this meeting, and you know, what's its what's its role in sort of the broader science community? So, it was started by E.P. Odom and a couple other professors at the University of Georgia back in the 1930s, and um, we're in our 85th year now. Um, it's a it's a regional meeting. It uh, in a couple decades ago, it was dominated mostly by the uh, big research universities. So the the main people going to those meetings were the professors and the PhD and master students from like NC State, Duke, and Chapel Hill, and Georgia, and those kind of schools. Um, but over the years, as the other societies like the Ecological Society and the American uh, uh, the Association of Plant Biologists and so on (BSA). Uh, have sort of attracted people to those meetings. Um, our membership has shifted more to the smaller comprehensive universities and the colleges in the in the region. So we don't get as many of the um, uh, students that come from those high powered research universities, but we do get a lot from these uh, you know mid sized and small uh, universities and colleges. And we've seen in recent years uh, a real uptick in the number of undergraduates presenting at these meetings. Um, they were very rare when I first joined, and, and now they make up a, a substantial proportion of the presenters. I think that reflects an effort by these types of schools to encourage uh, student undergraduate students to do research as part of their undergraduate curriculum. We've also enlarged the 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 scope of the um, research that's presented. Um, when E.P. Odom and others founded it, it was heavily dominated by the e ecological research and uh, and uh, on plants and then on animals. Um, but the last two decades or so, we've made a concerted effort to bring in all forms of biology research, including molecular and genetics. And, and we're seeing a lot more papers uh, being presented in those areas. So we still have a lot of organismal and ecological presentations, but now we're seeing molecular biology and and uh, genetics and microbiology and those things. So it's a better, it's a bigger diversity of, of uh, subjects and it encourages more students to come. So, um, and the other trend that I noticed this year um, was we used to have uh, some of these bigger schools that would attend, they would dominate the awards. Uh, mainly they have more resources and they'd send more students. And so that you, it would turn out that way. But this year I noticed um, that the schools, the students who were winning awards were coming from a lot of these smaller schools. And uh, th there wasn't the dominance I'd seen in past years. And I thought that was good. It spread the, the, the awards around to a greater diversity of students. I think it's because they too are encouraging more research. They may be hiring more research oriented faculty and devoting more resources to having their students do this undergraduate and master's level research. So those are the main trends I see over all the years. This is my 42nd year, you know, going to ASB. So that's great. And I, you know, I have one more meeting question for you. Do you get the sense that a meeting like this one allows people to get to the meetings, get to a meeting, and you know, find a seat at the table in, in ways that they might not otherwise have? Because it, you know, perhaps because of the regional nature, or um, you know, because of the sort of low key and relaxed environment. Yeah. So our meeting is. A, you know, less expensive than going to some of these big national and international meetings. And a lot of the schools will, you know, put this, you know, get a van and the students don't have to pay transportation. And then, you know, and then we put a bunch of students in a room. Everybody has a bed, but we still pile them into the hotel room and share them. Cut sure. costs. Um, but uh, I think it's a, it, it's a really good meeting for somebody's first presentation. 
That's how I always tell people. If, if this is your first presentation, whether as an undergraduate or as a graduate student, um, this is the best meeting to do it. And so most of my students will give their first presentation here. And then if they're continuing on to do their research and it really gets to be at a higher level, um, or they just get more time to do, get more data, then we think about going to one of the bigger meetings like the Botanical Society of America or the Ecological Society. And, uh, and then our students can present there. And it, they really enjoy interacting with people from other schools, finding out how they do it at other places. And, um, you know, if, if we have the money um, and we try to send them there, we, we have a program here called the Office of Student Research. And students can apply for travel funds to go to meetings. And they can also apply for research funds. And, you know, it's not a huge amount of money, but it, it can get some students, you know, uh, over the hump. And, uh, and then some of the affiliate societies, like the Southern Appalachian Botanical Society um, and Botanical Society of America, they provide auxiliary funding to get students to the meeting. So we try as hard as we can to find to cover transportation costs or the registration so that, you know, the students can get to these meetings. That's great. And, you know, that was that sort of effort was definitely appreciated by the students. I had the, the pleasure of interviewing while at the meeting. Um, and I think that's a, a great note on which to close. Uh, so thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed this. And we'll close out our coverage of ASB 2024 with three more chats conducted at the meeting itself. I asked our guests for these to introduce themselves so that I wouldn't have to break it in between them. Uh, but there, Skylar Fox is a master's student at Georgia Southern University, Ashley Woods, an undergraduate student at Wesleyan College, and Amy Allen, a biology teacher at Southern Lee High School. And let's go to those interviews now. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Okay, uh, could you introduce yourself, if you don't mind, and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing here? Yeah, uh, I'm Skylar Fox. I'm currently a master's student at Georgia Southern University, and um, I've been coming to ASB for the past, I guess, three or four years. The first year I attended was um, when it was virtual because of the pandemic, and I just love this conference. Um, my undergraduate advisor um, brought me here when I was starting to do research on plant conservation genetics. And I've come back as a master's student, even though my research is a little bit different, um, just because I love the community here and it provides great networking opportunities. Um, and yeah, just awesome. That's great. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your current research? What sort of things are you working on these days? Yeah, so um, my master's thesis is going to be focusing on the impact of trampling that occurs on footpaths on the dune system on Tybee Island, Georgia. Okay, and so are the are the footpaths any sort of developed infrastructure or are they just desire paths or where people like to walk? Yeah, so it's just the basically like the footpaths in the sand that come from inland from the hotels or condos or whatever to the beach. So just the mechanism that people use to walk from inland to the beach. And um, on Tybee, they have bridge crosswalks um, as well as these uh, footpaths that are just going through the sand. Um, and some previous studies have found that the footpaths cause more damage to the dune vegetation and just the overall dune structure as compared to bridge crossovers, um, which makes sense because, you know, there's going to be, when people trample and are walking uh, directly near the vegetation, that's going to cause more of an influence. Um, so I wanted to focus specifically on the footpaths in my study. So Okay, and what's the importance of that plant vegetation? Why do we, why do we care so much about what's growing on these dunes? So first of all, let me back up a little bit. And the reason that we want to protect dunes is because they provide coastal protection during um, events that are becoming more frequent like uh, hurricanes and also sea level rise. Um, so the, the, the vegetation, it can trap and sand, which actually helps the dune structure to be built up. And then the um, roots and uh, underground structures of the plants that also helps uh, the dune to stabilize itself so that the um, dune isn't the dune isn't being you know blown away by the for, wind, wind forces and stuff, stuff like that. So um, what kinds of things are you finding so far? So it's very early I just started my field work um, literally last week on Tybee um, but I can tell you what some of my hypotheses are. Sure. So another component to this project is that um, 
Ty be restored a section of their dune system in 2020. Um, so I'm looking at kind of the differences in the effects of trampling in the restored dune compared to the dunes that were previously established on the island, like the natural dunes. So I'm predicting that um, the restored dune it's going to be more heavily impacted by um, trampling and footpaths just because the dune isn't natural, first of all, and it's only been um, three years or I guess two since the completion of the dune restoration. So it's just not, um, the plants aren't as extensive and it's probably going to not be as um, resilient against trampling. Um, so yeah, that's my main hypothesis for what I'm going to see right now. Um, oh, that's really cool. So we should look at it at future ASB meetings for uh, presentations and, and posters and such on this work. Yes, definitely. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you first became involved with this meeting? You know, when when did you first start coming? Yeah. So my first ever uh, meeting was, I guess it was 20, 2020 or I guess maybe 2021, the year after it became like a virtual, just the one year it was virtual um, because of COVID. And so I, I um, had written a manuscript. Um, so yeah, it was 2021. And I had written a manuscript the previous summer based on um, the citizen science platforms and how the citizen science platforms like iNaturalist may uh, uh, be used in research and education. And so I did a presentation based on that manuscript. It's like a review manuscript that I wrote. And um, I won an award for it, so that was really exciting. Hey, that's cool. I literally didn't know that much about like how conferences worked, I guess. And it was just different because it was virtual. So I feel like I didn't really get to like absorb myself in the conference culture. Like I pretty much just did my talk and then I didn't really do anything else because I just didn't really know how conferences work. <laughs> sure, sure. But then um, I came back the next year and I presented a poster I had been doing conservation, plant conservation genetics work. Um, and then that's when I was like, oh, wow, this is such a cool place just to be able to go and look at other people's work that they've been doing. And it's also like a great environment for students, too, I think, because there's so many there's a very wide range of research that's presented here. And if you don't really know what you want in your future yet, like what kind of research that you want to be doing long term, then I think it's great to just kind of get exposure to different areas and different fields within biology that you, you know, hadn't maybe known anything about yet. Um, so after that, after I just kept, I've just kept coming since then. Um, and then last year I presented a talk um, when I was doing a post-baccalaureate fellowship at Furman where I went to undergrad. And then now I'm back again as a master's student um, and presenting a talk based on my research during my post-baccalaureate fellowship, and then also I did a poster based on uh, some of the sand dune stuff I've been doing. Oh, that's really cool. Um, so is, is your poster still up anywhere? No. <laughs> oh, I can't go so find no. it, darn it. It was taken down yesterday, but um, you can probably look at it online if you really want to find it. Oh, I'm sure I'll be able to track it down. Yeah. All right, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Okay, so I was hoping you could introduce yourself quickly. Uh, just, you know, tell us who you are and, you know, where you're from, where you study. Mm -hmm. Yes, my name is Ashley Woods. I'm a senior undergraduate, stu undergraduate student at Wesleyan College in Macon, Georgia, um, but I'm originally from Savannah, Georgia. At Macon, at Wesleyan, I study biology with a pre-veterinary uh, medicine concentration and a Spanish minor. That's really cool. And, um, you know, what kinds of things are you studying right now? So right now, uh, my research is a behavioral focus with betta fish. Uh -huh. uh, so my research involves looking at essential oils and their influence on the beta aggression. So that's my extracurricular research that I have been conducting in a lab for over two years now and presenting at ASB. Okay, and so the, and beta fish are the ones that, you know, we typically see kept in the uncomfortably small little cups at pet stores? Yes, so unfortunately they have this stereotype of they can survive in a tiny little bowl with no plants and no interaction, but that's far from the truth and they're often under an immense amount of stress. And so that's what my focus is, is trying to intervene that stress and improve the health of these organisms. Okay, great, and then why essential oils? Why essential oils, that's a great question. So in recent years, uh, there has been an extensive amount of research done on testing essential oils for their anesthetic efficacy on fish right. and so if they have this anesthetic efficacy I asked a question on if they could have a calming effect like some 
humans use for aromatherapy. Sure. And so I made that connection and decided to go that route with these betas. Oh, that's really cool. So what, which types of you know, essential oils did you, did you test on the fish? So I started with lavender. So I started with lavender essential oil. I call it Leo for short. And we went from, instead of choosing a bunch of different oils to go from, we decided to take their derivatives and their ingredients and focus on pure substances. So my recent studies have been using the main ingredients of Leo. Okay, that's interesting. So that works, or it's, it's more easy to determine what the effect, what caused exactly, the effect. Exactly, okay. that's the whole point is because the essential oils are very constituent mixtures. So it's hard to understand how much and what you're giving. And so if we can look at the, isolate the main ingredients, we can see what we're doing exactly. And you know, with no discredit, to my undergraduate biology education. Uh, yours sounds a lot cooler than mine. How did, how did you get into this kind of research? So I got into this research because Wesleyan is amazing with presenting students with research opportunities. So there's this course I have to take as biology major. It's a research methods class. You learn about experiments and how to do all these sorts of different things. And a part of it was devising your own pilot, very quick and easy study to present on in front of the class. And it was part of the final grade. And when I presented, my professor, Dr. BT, who's actually the president of ASB, she said that the winner of the best poster presentation would get a free pass to the ASB conference in the spring. So that would have been of March of 2022. Mm -hmm. And I won that presentation. And so I was able to continue my research and start presenting. And then it just took off from there. Um, and I've continued to present ASB. This is my third time. And my research was actually published last semester. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. I have one other question about the, uh, about the beta fish. Are there? I always ask people to scoop themselves. And I'm sorry for that, but <laughs> any preliminary findings on whether you know the the Leo has a calming effect? Yes. So we, I was able to demonstrate at the concentration that I tested that it was able to induce a calming effect, and it severely, re significantly reduced their aggression, meaning it could inhibit that agonistic behavior. Oh, that's 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 really you know interesting. So is that can we use that as a proxy for? their stress levels? Yes, yeah, so the idea is we want to suggest this substance as something that can be treated before stressful circumstances like transportation or housing and like really bad conditions at on just pet stores and things like that. Sure, yeah. And if we can treat them just for a few minutes before they get going, we can significantly reduce their stress during those circumstances and improve their overall health, both in the short term and the long term. Right, and they're also not as miserable in the meantime. Exactly, yeah, they're, they don't really, they're just, Help, hanging out and chilling and they're not really worried about having to defend themselves. Oh, that's really great. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the meeting. So this, yeah. is, this is your third one? Yes, it is. Okay, great. And, um, you know, uh, do you like it? What do you, how do you find I it? I love it. Um, while this is the only like regional or like scientific conference I've been to, I don't know that I would want to go to any other ones. I mean, this one is just so great. Um, the amount of different experiences that I've had, I've done poster and oral presentations, and each time I do something different, I talk to new people, I meet new disciplines that I didn't even know were a thing, and it's just so immersive and so interdisciplinary that the education that I'm getting here is just as much as in a classroom. Oh, that's great, and it's it's so cool to be able to do that as another. Yes, group. yes, I'm extremely grateful for for my experience and I owe it all to Wesleyan there. I mean, it's just amazing that I'm getting to do this with my classmates. Great, this has been such a cool chat. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, hi, I'm Amy Allen. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about yourself. So I am a high school biology teacher. I am from Lee County, North Carolina. I teach at Southern Lee High School. I have been teaching for 12 years. Um, and for the last three years, I have taught strictly biology. That's great. And biology. Tell me a little bit about Lee County, North Carolina. Um, we're central, like okay. part of North Carolina, just south of Raleigh. We're rural. Our county only has um, two high schools. We have about 1,500 students max maybe probably less i think it's around 1100 actually um so small class sizes are smaller um i think max last year my biggest class was around 30 but this year that's been about 20 to 20 to 30. um so yeah it's it's a great place to live i i'm not from there i moved there um about 12 years ago when i started teaching right. there um and and we've loved it and we're raising our family there and and we enjoy it that's fantastic and um, so, you know, how is it to teach biology there? It's, it's good. I have great uh, department. I've got a great uh, uh, lead teacher. I've got a supportive staff. Anytime I need lab equipment, I've got microscopes. I feel like anytime I need something that would support me in the classroom, I have that. Okay. 
And so one thing we've been touching on a lot so far in the interviews this morning has been, you know, the, the focus on undergraduate education. Um, you're a high school biology teacher. What brings you here? So I was uh, awarded the Outstanding Biology Teacher for mm -hmm. my region uh, through NABT in tw uh, 2022. 2022. Um, and so then Janelle Talley reached out to me last year regarding the Lucretia Her Award. Um, and so last year I came to ASB for the first time and accepted that award. Congratulations. Um, and thank you. And so since then, um, Chris Havern and I have been working together on how we can kind of bridge the gap between high school and college um, and, and really kind of focusing on um, how secondary educators like myself and university professors can collaborate together uh, to meet state standards. Because in North Carolina, biology is a state tested course. Uh -huh. uh, so it's a very strict, very rigorous course load, lots to cover in 90 days right. in a small semester. Um, and so how can we work together still following state standards, but also showing them that there are other opportunities out there in the sciences, that you can be a scientist. Students, We want students to view themselves as scientists, um, and I think that starts in the high school. That's interesting. So is the idea to kind of, you know, prepare them not just, um, you know, on, a, on an academic level, but also sort of, you know, get them in the mindset of, um, you know, thinking of themselves as scientists, that yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, and, and, you know, my job is to make sure that, that they do well and they, they do well in their final exam and that, you know, there's lots of pressures that come along with state exams. But I also want them to know that it's not just the test, right. that there are other opportunities out there. And if you think that anything that I'm talking about is just a little bit interesting, take it, run with it, because I, I just right. barely scratched the surface. I have, you know, such a small time frame. Um, and so I think if students are able to go out to the universities to see college professors, to hear professors talk to them about these opportunities, um, I think it, it really opens their mind and, and shows them the, the possibilities that are out there. And so, you know, kind of on a nuts and bolts level, what is the program that you're working on you know, what, what does it do? You mentioned, you know, students going out to universities mm -hmm. and um, meeting professors. Yeah. What, what kind yeah. of stuff are you up to? Okay, so it, it's been a, a year-long collaboration with Chris and I, and so it kind of started out as just, hey, you think we could work together? Yeah, let's see what happens. He came out um, and did a, a classroom presentation with my students last May. Um, so that was a really quick turnaround. I mean, we met in March, and in May he was wow. in my classroom. Um, yeah, and he made sure, you know, I sent him my standards. I showed him exactly, you know, what I cover. He picked through it, found some topics that he could relate to, um, and he came up with a presentation. He came out and did it. So then over the summer, we went and toured Campbell University. Um, and then since then, um, we realized that this was something that I could bring 30 high school students um, to his campus. He came up with a two-part lab. It started in my classroom one Friday. The following Friday, we bused the kids across county lines. It was about a 45-minute drive to Campbell University, um, and they toured the campus, and they wrapped up their lab from the previous week, and they... Um, uh, we had an admissions guide, take them around, show them campus. They had lunch on campus. Uh, so they had, they really enjoyed it. That sounds it. like a blast. What kind of, what, 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 what do they do in the lab? So they all brought in plant specimens from their home, mm -hmm. uh, the week prior. Chris helped them press the plants and dry them. And yeah. then they, we took him to his lab and him and one of his, uh, 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 students identified the plants together. So part of our curriculum is identifying species, knowing um, classification and um, genus and species and all that. So they went through, classified it, mounted them on their, their paper. They came up with like a little um, ID card for uh -huh. each one. Um, and then they also organized some of Chris's plant specimens that he would have to, uh, I think it was based off a of family. Um, oh, that sounds great. Do you think we'll be seeing those students here in a year or two? I, maybe. I think, yeah, I do have some students who say, you know, I'm going into biology, right. I'm doing this. Um, I had one last year who's like, I, I'm starting, I can't wait. I've got, you know, so we'll see. I don't know what kind of their pathway was after, um, whether or not they were trying to do MD or what kind of, what they were doing. But yeah. hopefully I, I have been looking around thinking it's, it's a possibility. The interest and involvement have been sparked. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they've come back. I mean, the pictures were great. They, they really enjoyed their time. And I just, I think in our area, in a rural area, uh, the students just don't know of the opportunities that are out there for them. Right. Um, I don't think that they can see a pathway for them. If they find interest in biology, if they like cells or whatever, I don't think that they can see, like, there's a pathway for me to take to make this a career. Um, and so I think just educating them on that pathway and just letting them know, like, if you like this, see what, see what you can do with it. Right. And I'm here to help. 
and you have all these professors in these universities that want to help as oh, well. That is so cool and so valuable. Are you, are you giving a talk today? Yes, at 1.30. At 1.30? Yes. Great. Uh, Very nervous. <laughs> so it's going to be a talk describing? It, what I just explained, yeah. Basically how we work together to, to come up with this plan and hopefully to share with other professors like reach out in your community. Um, you know, here in Tennessee and the way that the public school systems work in different states and different counties, I mean, it varies greatly. So what I did in my county, it could be something completely different in their county. And I think that's kind of we need to figure out how to bridge that gap. How can we get more counties, uh, high school teachers communicating with university professors to build those relationships and to build the relationships with the students? Great. That sounds incredibly valuable. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for joining me. Thank you. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. A big thank you to all of ASBS leadership for their help in setting up all of these interviews that you've heard today and for their kind hospitality when I was at the meeting. I hope to be there again sometime. Thank you.